The Russians have now deployed potentially nuclear-tipped Zircon hypersonic missiles on the frigate Admiral Gorshkov in the North Atlantic. In the North Atlantic, they could strike Europe. It could strike America easily with hypersonic, very fast nuclear missiles. These missiles are so fast, they go 6,900 miles per hour. And they're, if launched off the coast of America, they could cover 100 miles in just a minute. And they're talking about putting these things like right next to Washington, D.C., basically in the international waters. It's only 12 miles out, but 12 and a half miles out, and they're in international waters. And they can cover, in less than a minute, 100 miles. They can cover 570 miles, so, excuse me, 575 miles in just five minutes. Guys, this is a huge threat. It could, guys, it, our guys on the East Coast have no time to prepare. Uh, you know, if uh, uh, Joe B is up in his bedroom, uh, he don't even have time to wake up and clear his throat. And he's got less than a minute. How, five minutes even. If he had that long, how would he get to his basement? How would he get to his bunkers? How would he get to his war room? Or, or uh, General um, you know, Mark Mealy, Mealy Vanilli, how would he get into his war room? How would these guys deploy themselves just to take action, just to respond? Uh, their pants would be down if uh, these things hit the ground because it would come in so fast. That's the problem with these hypersonic missiles is they're fast. I have talked about this in the past. I warned you about this three years ago, this very deployment of these missiles on a video. I'm going to show you that in a little bit. But this, these missiles are out there now. They have been deployed. Why? Why are these in the North Atlantic? Why is Medvedev, Dmitry Medvedev, uh, calling for putting them right off the coast of Washington, D.C., which they very well may be there or hidden there because they are in the area of danger. Why is this happening now, my friends? Are we risking a nuclear first strike by Russia? I've talked about this in the past. And I've talked about he who strikes first wins, especially if it's Russia. And I know all you guys, oh, we got our ICBM, uh, we got our, our nuclear uh, uh, submarines out there. They'll take care of it. No, they won't. I'm going to explain that. I'm going to explain why you cannot rely on that as your deterrent, given the threat posture of a super EMP weapon attack and other things that could be and would be deployed in such a war. So we're going to talk about this. We're going to go into this. But first, I'm going to show you some stuff. I'm going to show you this Admiral Gorsuch. I'm going to show you my videos on this stuff. So just hang on your pants, guys. Hang, uh, Grab on, because this is going to get fast and furious. So I'm going to do a screen share. And we're going to come over here. There it is. This is the missile frigate. The Admiral Gorshkov. The Admiral Gorshkov can carry 16 Zircon, 16 nuclear tip Zircon missiles. This, this boat right here is in the North Atlantic. And guys, look at this guy. This guy's actually went around the world in the past. And, and it can carry quite a range of weapons on board, even though it's not a it's a frigate, it's not a gigantic ship, but what it carries, it makes it maneuverable, makes it hideable. So uh, this, this thing, uh, being able to carry this many missiles is quite the threat. Armaments, if you come down here, uh, look, you can carry the caliber missile, which this one is one that we were concerned about. I'll show you some stuff on this caliber missile in a little bit. I've, uh, I've got stuff that shows the range of what would happen with a caliber missile. This is not your hypersonic missile, though, but it is quite deadly. And there's charts that depict the use of that missile. The Zircon missile, oh, yeah, this is worse than this. And I got a chart on the rate range of this missile to show you. But uh, this missile is much faster. We're going to talk about this, guys. Hang on. I'm going to have to move this down. Bing, bing, bing. And here is the video where I warned about this very thing three years ago. Putin ponders first strike. And you can see this, the Russian map here and the, the potential of the submarines off base here. And guys, yeah, yeah, they got this Zircon's also submarine launchable. It is surface ship launchable. We don't know what might be out there in submarines. So bear this in mind, guys. Bear this in mind. Here's some old videos I did. I, I, I did this one right here. Why Russia to launch nukes? Uh, why, why a first strike would be in their advantage? And then I did this one with, uh, this is the last interview I did with Dr. Peter Vincent Pry, talking about why we were on the brink with Russia. And he was talking about how Russia could actually pull off a first strike against the United States. I've talked about that myself in the past, prior to this and after this. So, uh, and we will go into more depth on that in a moment. But let's just kind of click through these real quick. Uh, Got to fight the Zoom 
out, unfortunately. So let's go up here. Here we go. Jerusalem Post. Russia's production and use of hypersonic missiles, the Zircon. Yeah. Currently in maritime version. Yeah, this thing has just got fielded, guys. This missile went operational on the 4th. Today is the 6th. In some areas, it's already the 7th. It's just a Mach 9 missile. It says 1,000 kilometer range. I'll show you exactly what that is again. Former Russian President Dmitry Medvedev threatened the United States of America with this missile. Uh, and he claimed this was, this is a quote from him. The main gift of the new year was the arsenal of Zircon missiles that went yesterday to the shores of NATO countries. This is Medvedev. And he also called for putting this thing off the shore of Washington, D.C. And other articles that I've seen. I'm going to show you every article I read. It's Jerusalem Post there. Oh, yeah. We're going to show you also an article from TASS. This is, I guess, the voice of uh, American news, the BOA. Uh, you're telling us that, uh, oh, yeah, this is the pride of the Russian Navy. Yeah, the Admiral Gorshkov. And we're talking about how this went through the test and trials. Yes, this missile can go uh, 1,120 to five kilometers per hour for you in a metric system or 6,900 miles per hour according to the stats on the missile. Guys, if you haven't considered it prepping right now, you need to do it. You need to really think about it. Get it while the getting's good, while there's still a getting in the hood. <laughs> and guess what? This special deal right here really tops them all. Four-week supply of emergency food, 2,000 calories a day. This is over 2,000. The competitors, you'll be lucky to get 800. Guys, and this comes in these two bucket buckets. You've seen me in many videos throwing these buckets around. I have to show you that again. These buckets are lightweight, easy to store, rugged, and useful after you've uh, consumed your food <laughs> for many reasons. But uh, for uh, a full month supply of food that lasts 25 years for $177, don't tell me that's too expensive. But if you can't handle it, go get your beans and rice, guys. Go do it. All right, let's move on. So prepwithgreg.com, prepwithgreg.com. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of other prepping supplies here, too. All you got to do is click my patient supply from prepwithgreg.com, and it takes you a whole uh, plethora of survival items, emergency food, other kind of food, water filtration, sales, survival coffee. If you're like me, you got to have it. Seeds, air purification, just many odds and ends. All right, we're going to skip that bean. Let's go on. And they also have this other submarine that's at sea that was supposed to have been decommissioned. The submarine is supposed to have been decommissioned. They said they were going to decommission. It was bye-bye, but uh -uh, now it is in the ocean. And this missile carries 20, uh, up to 20 nuclear-tipped missiles. And these are MERV missiles that can carry up to 10 warheads, 6 to 10 warheads each. That's a potential of 200 targets from this supposed to have been decommissioned submarine <clears throat> oh yeah they have other submarines there. why did they stop and and not they got two new classes of submarines out they have whole new classes of submarines out so why do they keep this in the fleet and why is this at sea right now at least that's what i'm hearing guys according to source some send this submarine is part of the old bubble class it's still at sea it's there with all these missiles <clears throat> yeah it's carrying these uh ball bubble uh, uh, submarine launch ballistic missiles, guys. These are not a joke. I mean, hey, well, just look at it, guys. Here's this missile, guys. <clears throat> this guy here, as I said, would carry six to nine warheads, or six to ten, excuse me, six to ten warheads, and a 100 to 150 kiloton range. That's, that's uh, you know, ten times more powerful than what took you out uh, Hiroshima basically. More powerful. It would really do a city in or a target in. Now, here is the caliber target range I was showing you guys earlier for the caliber missiles. Well, the Zircon's going to be a lot faster. It'd be a bigger threat, guys. But this is, this is what you would worry about from there. And this includes a lot of the important naval targets, naval station targets, and others, like the submarine base at Kings Bay. Yeah, we'll go back to that again. We'll show you some more on that in a moment. We'll show you another target list. Bing. Here is the Zircon. And unlike the, uh, the, the Kinzel, which they've been firing in, which is their hypersonic, supposedly hypersonic missile, they've been firing into Ukraine. The Kinzel is nothing like this missile. The Kinzel is really just a, a hyper-boosted 
hypersonic glide vehicle. This vehicle, the Zircon, is an air breathing, scramjet powered, true hypersonic missile. This guy is, see, they, they've already filled it, sir, way ahead of us in this technology category. We've just got through testing hypersonic missiles with scramjets. Well, the Russians have filled it, the Zircon. And the Zircon is a bad boy. This is their new weapon, guys. And it's way beyond the Kinzel, which I'll show you. Is this the Kinzel? No, it's more on the Zircon. Okay. The Zircon here, guys, this has got the scramjet engine. It's got a warhead weight of 880 pounds, up to 880 pounds. And yeah, this can carry quite a warhead, a nuclear warhead, up to 200 kilotons nuclear warhead, guys. And yeah, it's, a, it's got a range of 540 nautical miles or more if it's launched from higher up, like from an airplane or something like that, where it's got more glide. It's got more glide. But this thing is self-powered. It should have glide. So this, this thing is a, a quite a beast submarine and surface ship launched. And we know that now on the Admiral uh, Gorshkov surface ship, the frigate, which is in the North Atlantic. So these missiles have been developed and they are deployed. They are operational and they present a clear and present danger. Anyway, let's go beyond here. This is the Russian Strategic Rocket Forces. You can find this stuff on Wikipedia. Just look them up. Look up Zircon. Look up the Strategic Rocket Forces. And you can go ahead and read all about this stuff. And here is the organizations in it. But what's interesting here, I'm going to show you this missile right here. Some people are talking about, well, the Russians don't have any missiles. They... And all their silos are rusty. Well, this is a mobile launcher. This missile, the, the, the RS-24 Yars missile, is on a mobile launcher. But they've been putting these in silos recently. Let's just make news. They just stuck a bunch of these missiles in silos. Oh, yeah, by the way, here, here is the Russian nuclear forces map. That's where they put these guys. They got them everywhere. But the mobile ones can be anywhere. So, so much for that, guys. And here's the intercontinental ballistic missiles all we've got is one missile we got our minute man well we also got our uh, submarine launch missiles okay but guys russia's got a lot of things in service in service in service in service in service in service yeah well, let's look at some more of this stuff yeah here's what i'm talking about yars ICBMs loaded into silos in central Russia. See, this is a 13 December article. Here's this 14 December. <laughs> There's a time zone. Oh, yeah, this comes from the Russians. This is a test. So, but Greg, how come you only look at this many or that many? I come like this stuff. Yeah, this is coming straight to you guys from the Russians themselves. Okay. That's something you don't believe and trust the Russians. Okay, whatever. We do know that they were putting us in silos, and we knew, do know they just rolled out this brand new RS-28 Sermat Satan II missile, which they can actually fire over the South Pole. They can fire all the way around the Earth and come at us and sneak these uh, attack uh, in from the Gulf of Mexico over the South Pole, you know, where our radars are not looking. They could totally sneak attack us with this missile. And this thing is said to be able to carry 10 to 15 MERV warheads. I think that's in addition to decoys, or you can carry some unspecified number of this hypersonic vehicle, the Avagar. So, yeah, they've got all kinds of new weapons. The Avagar, they got the Skyfall, they've got the Poseidon nuclear uh, torpedo on the Belograd submarine, which the Belograd is now at sea. The Poseidon, maybe it's through its test, guys. And another thing, Russia, this is why I would say that Russia might go first, is one, they've got a whole lot of anti-ballistic missiles and i can find two of them right here right off that's the ballistic intercontinental ballistic missile this is one of their uh uh this s300 vm this is an anti-ballistic missile come back here this uh one i click on guys this s500 that's also an anti-ballistic missile russians have many anti-ballistic missiles we've got ground-based interceptor we've got ages but we don't have uh, near as much as they've got. Now, to, to paint the picture fairly, 
<coughs> or crystal, or crystal, whatever the count was, I fucking missed it. Yeah, there it is, the Kinzel. This Kinzel hypersonic missile that they've been firing into uh, Ukraine is really an air launch version of the Iskalander missile, which is a theater based uh, uh, short range, but atom bomb capable, a nuclear capable uh, battlefield nuclear missile. It's a short range ballistic missile. This thing can carry nukes. Uh, they've not been launching them with nukes into Ukraine, but it is nuke capable. So they've been using these Isklanders and the Kinzels, and the, the Isklander is kin to the Kinzel. Okay. Ha ha ha. Targets, what would they strike? Let me back off for a minute. Let's just talk for a second. What am I talking about? Well, you know, guy, big, big, it's all nonsense, never happened. Um, what I'm talking about is this. How would Russia do a first strike on the United States? Well, they would EMP us. They would hit us with those EMP super weapons, uh, one of which properly placed over, say, Omaha or North Kansas could take out our entire electrical grid nationwide and take down a lot of our command and control structures because uh, it's been published in congressional record in 2008 that these weapons are capable of putting out 200,000 volts per meter on our grid, on our communications lines. That is huge. The old standard for hardening military facilities was 50,000 volts per meter, which was a quarter of the power of these EMP super weapons. They got four times the power of our old hardening standard to harden ourselves against such a thing. So these EMP super weapons are maximized for producing gamma rays which strip the electrons free in the atmosphere that causes the EMP pulse, the E1 wave, the E1 wave, the E2 wave. E2 is kind of lightning. Like and then you get an E3 wave, which is a longer wave component that comes in through the ground and comes back up uh, and, and gets your systems. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you didn't know about that one, did you? Uh, and that may be the most destructive one coming out of an EMP. That's also the wave that gets you from a CME. And little bitty cheap boxes that are uh, just, you know, Lightning arresters uh, sold by some companies ain't going to cut it, my friends. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, they're supposed to shunt things to the ground. They ain't got no defense from something coming from the ground. And, yeah, I don't even want to go into that, guys. So, all right, so I'm going to show you what you need to do to prepare. But so here's what would happen. You would have a multi-pronged, multi-faceted attack. This is what Dr. Pry always talked about. You would have uh, EMP cyber attack and direct ballistic attacks, the kinetic attacks, like what's been going on at our substations, but more like the one that occurred at the Metcalf station. You have professional teams go in and attack our critical components. Oh, yeah. Uh, isn't it coincidental and they're highly dubious to wonder why is it that the Chinese have been buying lots of property right next to a lot of our critical military bases? Oh, nothing to worry about, right? Oh, there's nothing to worry about. That's just over there. You want a new pig farm? Yeah. But they always like to put their pig farms or whatever it is right next to a lot of our critical military bases. They bought a lot of properties like that. Hmm. Oh, guys, makes you wonder. Makes you wonder. You know, the Chinese and Russians are kind of in bed with each other in some of these operations, potentially. Potentially. They might take advantage of, of something going down and they just might all act at once because it gives them Taiwan to knock us out. I mean, the, uh, an EMP could bring the United States to its knees, but it wouldn't just be EMP, it'd be cyber attack, EMP, and the direct kinetic attacks, all three. And, oh yeah, anti-satellite weapons. When all these systems, they would be trying to prevent us from launching ICBMs or, or, or submarine launch based uh, ballistic missiles from our submarine fleet deployed at sea. Because the submarines cannot launch unless they get an, EA, an EAM, which we've covered in the video, the, a lot of EAMs went, but they got to get a validated EA, EAM that says launch. If the grids are fried, if communications are fried, now, see, those things actually require a lot of things. They require communications networks. It requires computer networks to get that EAM out there. It requires satellite networks. So, so there's hacking, there's anti-satellite weapons, and super EMPs. Oh, yeah, and uh, China's been practicing their simulations, at least, of uh, detonating the EMPs up in space, higher up, to take out satellites, in addition to direct 
anti-satellite weapons. It's a cleaner way. Don't throw a lot of orbital debris in space. Just fry the electronics. Hmm. So there's a lot of things that's been practiced between uh, Russia and China for taking out our means of taking out uh, not being able to use our submarines. Ah, and should we still be able to launch all our submarines? What I just showed you was the uh, that Russia has a very robust um, anti-ballistic missile system to try to take these out should they come in. And should that fail, Russia also has been training extensively on the use of their underground bunkers. Now, they had an exercise what, about a year ago in which they put uh, the entire city of Moscow in bunkers, basically. Uh, we never did anything like that here. So uh, Russia, you know, Vladimir Putin has said himself that Russia could fight and win a nuclear war. He said it several times. They came out recently, so nobody can win a nuclear war. But, you know, we've got this mantra, nuclear wars must not be fought because nuclear wars can't be won. That's, that's a mantra you hear from our State Department a lot. I think he said that, but he said the other many more times. Than he probably just said it playing lip service to make our guys relax. The art of war, Sun Tzu, make your enemy relax. Ah, oh, how are you doing, my friend? Sit down. Can I get you a drink? You want something to eat? Stab him in the back. Since they relax, you know, that's the art of war. So you don't tell people what you're going to do necessarily, even though you got Medvedev out barking, making threats. And again, it could be the good cop, bad cop. This all could be oyster. It all could be a bluff. Let's hope it's just a bluff. But uh, it may not be. It may not be. Let's go look at some other stuff here. So that would be it. They would, here's what, uh, let me finish this. So they would take out our command and control and our grid through EMPs, through satellite attacks, through cyber attacks, direct kinetic attacks on substations and communication stations too, and maybe even military bases. I mean, guys, what protects our military bases? Oh, just a chain link fence and some deputy dogs at the gate. <laughs> There is no troops deployed or on a periphery of a military base. The troops aren't even permitted to carry a weapon on base, army base, an air force base, and you can't even carry a weapon. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> Unless you are a part of the law enforcement there. Maybe you're on the gate. <laughs> I kid you not. You see, this is why the Taliban kicked our rear ends in Afghanistan, they just went right into the bases and took whatever they wanted. Once they got mad enough at us to kick us out, they just stormed the bases and grabbed everything. And our guys ran with their tails tucked between their legs. Whew. Yeah, we didn't have foxholes and trenches in those bases, you know, just like the bases here, just, just uh, <laughs> chicken wire almost. <laughs> Anyway, chain link fences to be more precise. That's what you find on all the bases in the United States. Yeah, I could see the, 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 the drug gangs coming out, the cartels coming out of Mexico and just coming in. I could see uh, sleeper cells attacking different places. Yeah, we could have an ugly situation. All right, I don't want to belabor this too much, but guys, here's what would happen. The Russians would go full force into our intercontinental ballistic missile sites. So we go in full force to attack our submarine bases. Anything that we could launch back would be hit and hit real fast. Just as soon as they were MPing us, that other stuff would be on its way. It would already be coming. So as soon as they launch that uh, Zircon, lights go out. You didn't even get any news about it. You won't even know about it unless you're close to some of the target areas, or you're going to notice your lights are out. Hmm. Transformer must have believed, right? That's what you'll think probably initially. Or a squirrel got in a, in a substation. <laughs> but it'd be much worse. Much, much worse. So let's go back here and look at this stuff here. Oh, yeah, by the way. So they would probably take out all these things. And then if there was anybody left to be in charge of the United States, they'd call them up. So, okay, we've taken that the tea, all the teeth out of your hound dog. You can't bite us. You can't do nothing. And now we're about to start taking cities unless you surrender. And this may be the way they also keep them watching submarine uh, ballistic missiles. Unless you surrender now, it's New York. And in five minutes, another five minutes later, it's going to be Los Angeles. It'll be Seattle, Portland. I'll just start naming cities. And if they don't hear back, 
city start popping. Poof. Poof. Maybe. Maybe. So Dr. Pry always thought that that's what they did. They hit our, all of our strategic forces and then go for the cities on a blackmail basis. If there's nobody to blackmail, they might not worry about it. So being in a city is the worst place to be. Immediately being near one of these key military bases will be. I'm going to show you those. But, 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 guys, you don't want to be in a city because the city are going to have, you know, they're going to have no utilities, no water, no nothing. Sewer won't work. You can't drink. You can't eat. Oh, it's going to be a food desert full of hungry cannibals. Yeah. You don't want to be in a city. If you're in a city, get out. If you're close to a city, uh -uh. that's going to be the worst place to be. If you're within a tank of gas drive from a city, look out, guys. Just look out. That's all I got to say. They're going to be pouring out of the cities. All right, let's go back to the share again. <clears throat> Here we are. This will be the primary targets, primary initial targets. The Minot, Maelstrom, Warren Air Force bases. This is where our missile forces are. You know, they'll, they'll be hitting. Uh, also, we've got Minot's also got B-52s. We've got bombers there. They'll be hitting uh, submarine bases like Kings Bay. They'll be hitting uh, you know, other air bases, you know, Kirkland, Barksdale. Oh, yeah, the Pentagon, Nash the Pentagon. <laughs> NORAD, absolutely NORAD. Uh, yeah, Strategic Missile Integration Complex. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. I'm not sure Fort Greeley, Alaska, where we got our ABM sites at. But then our ABMs aren't, ballistic, aren't nuclear missiles. They're only defensive missiles. And by the time they fire all this stuff, that's gone. But they might hit this with a bomber. They might drop a Zircon into Fort Greeley from a, a air launch from a fair bomber out here. So that might happen, guys. All right, here's another image of some targets. This shows a lot more. What it shows is they were like carpet nuke or these bases right here where we got our uh, Minuteman missiles and our SAC bases, guys. It was just If you're anywhere downwind of these areas, forget about it, guys. There's going to be a whole lot of uh, radiation coming because these military bases will be attacked with ground launches. Uh, a ground burst. The ground burst is going to maximize the fallout because it's going to pick all that dirt up from the ground burst and disperse fallout downwind from it. Of course, you know, these may not be the ginormous nukes, but when you get so many, you have a lot of fallout coming from these areas. The smaller military bases are going to have uh, small nukes. Uh, the fallout pattern won't be as long or as big, uh, but it will be there. Uh, the cities, if they target cities, it will be air burst. And it'll be very little fallout. So if you're outside of the initial air burst, it won't be as bad. Although there will still be some fallout. What should you do? Well, oh yeah, other than helping to stop the, uh, get the grid hardened. Come down here to my nuclear survival and prepping playlist. Watch these videos, nuclear survival. There's a lot of details in these two videos talking about what the radiation is how much is deadly, what the threat is, all the details of the nuclear radiation you can find in these two videos. Uh, videos. This one is about nuclear bug out safe zones. And here's what you might do in the first and second 24 hours. And here's a video about the instrumentation to tell what your dose rates are and things like that. So check those videos out and come down here and look at the videos on uh, safe bug out zones that plays into that. This tells you how to grow your food in addition to uh, how bad our food situation already is. Prepping videos down here, my friends. Uh, check out how to filter and sanitize water by many methods. I'll show you how to do it even plastic bottles. Or look, how do you survive in the, off of winter wilds? You know, if you, it's the winter time when this hits like now, and there's no green stuff growing. Ah, oh, but there's green stuff growing. There's a ton of edibles videos in here, guys. <laughs> so I got a ton of wild edibles videos in here. There's more than that. So check those out. And finally, join our Survival Tribe Network, survivaltribenetwork.com. Let's form up so we got each other's backs. That's what this is all about. Come in here and join this. All righty. Enough said. Stop share. So will this happen? I'm not saying it will happen. What I am saying is... Uh, he who strikes first wins. And Putin thinks 
and has, has said that Russia can fight and win a nuclear war. Whether he's right or not, if he believes that, if his cohorts around him believe that, if his military generals believe that, that can be a problem. Whether it's true or not, all they got to do is believe it's the truth. Perception is everything to some people until they discover the perceptions were off, but then it's usually too late. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I got friends who said, oh, they can't launch in because they can't even push a button or their silos are drippy and wet. Yeah, they've had some of that in the past, but they've just outfitted new silos. They've just put the, the, the Yars 24 uh, missiles and new silos. They've just uh, put the um, Zircon out to fill at the sea. They've just put the Sarmat uh, 2, Satan 2 missile, excuse me, Sarmat or Satan 2 missile. Uh, in, in the operation, we're putting it in operation right now. We've tested it. So, guys, we are in a threat situation that we've never seen before. Uh, but Medvedev, and not Medvedev, but you can tell me that these guys says, "Oh, well, they won't use their missiles unless it's a, there's an existential threat against Russia." Problem with that is you got to figure out how you define existential threat and what is to Russia. It's really to the leadership. The Putin is to him. Uh, existential threat is meaning that they lose territory they consider to be Russia, like maybe even the areas they already annexed out of Ukraine. They consider that now to be Russian territory, and they are losing it. So um, they may consider these things, what they really consider is if we were to run into Moscow. But, you know, that's actually something that Ukraine is talking about. They're saying, hey, we got to we got to try these guys' war crimes. So that could lead to Russia deciding to launch. I got friends who will argue against this. Oh, no, that'll never happen. And for all, the, all these different reasons. But if the Russians can perceive this to be an existential threat, which don't use it mean to the people, it means to the powers that be, then there is a risk. There is a risk. And why else are they deploying these systems? Why are they both developing robust missile defense, practicing the drills, got the EMP super weapons and developing such a broad range of uh, brand new missiles, missile systems, hypersonics, systems that you would use in a first strike. Is it just for fun? Giggles, bragging rights? God, I hope that's all it is, my friends. But we're in perilous times. Get ready. That's my bottom line. And, if, and, and getting ready for this means you're ready for many other things that could happen, like the sun taking us out. If you don't believe this is going to happen, at least if you're ready for this, you'll be ready for the sun. Oh, yeah, and the sun's got a big new sunspot coming around. It's been shooting off big X-class flares, and it's about to point right at us. So, oh, yeah, this is Greg Allison with Green Gregs and Galactic Gregs. So, well, that too. But I'm going to put this on Green Gregs, and I think I'll put this on also Swivelhead News. Greg Allison, Swivelhead News, Galactic Gregs. <laughs> wow, i got so many channels. I'm getting confused. Green Gregs. So, guys, thank you for watching. And with that, I'm going to say, prepare. Prepare. Get ready. Prep and pray. We survive to another day. I bring you this simply because it's a proposition of my channel. So if you survive, thrive, and stay out of the hide. I don't believe we can do it, but we got to work it. So get busy, prep, and pray. Start it today if you haven't already done it. <laughs> well, I'm saying, again, Thank you for watching and rig out.